I said the Platinum 100 Hours might be my last video on this mini-series, didn't I? Well, I said might. This is most probably my last video on this mini-series. I don't want to overstay the welcome on this whole thing, and even this video might be pushing it a bit. Amidst all the different types of Nuzlocke that I try to set up so that the challenges don't become stale, one thing that I can't deny is that the Nuzlocke are quite stressful to go through. Although losing a run and having to re-strategize and recoup is most certainly a part of the fun, I do find myself wanting to enjoy the Pokemon games as I did when I was younger, just taking the time to explore and seeing what I could find. Although these 100 hours videos are by no means not stressful to make, which you'll see later in the video, it's nice to be able to just sit down and play Pokemon. Hopefully, the upcoming Scarlet and Violet games will provide as much wonder and joy as the earlier entries in the series did for me. For now, we go back to the usual objectives for this series. I've decided to not alter the ROM too much for this video, with the trade evolutions being the only exception. This meant that I wouldn't be able to complete the Pokedex, making it impossible to get a Black Trainer card. Currently, I don't know how to trade Pokemon between two Desmume emulators, so scratching the National Pokedex objective made sense. I also wanted to keep a more vanilla experience for this video, seeing what I could come up with in the base game. Going back to the Great Trainer card, these are the things that we'll need to complete to obtain it. We need to enter the Hall of Fame, beat records in all 10 Pokeathlon events, show a Pokemon with 5 shiny leaves to Ethan or Lyra, and we need to defeat 100 trainers in a row in the Battle Tower. To the people who have subbed to this channel, thank you so much for sticking around and watching the content here. I know this isn't the most excitable and gripping channel, but I hope you enjoy your stay. To the first time visitors, I hope the following video doesn't make your day any worse. With that said, hello. This is the 100 hours I spent in Pokemon Heart Gold. One of the main reasons I always name my character Fool is simple, really. It makes it a lot easier for the other characters in the game to insult us by calling us a fool. Our mother told us that Professor Elm and Lyra was looking for us, so we gratefully accepted the Poke gear from her and left home. Lyra and her Meryl made an appearance right from the get-go, contributing absolutely nothing to this game. Well, maybe not nothing. Close to nothing. Next to the lab, we have our rival peeping in sight. Professor Elm had an errand for us to run, so he wanted to give us a Pokemon to accompany us. I've never chosen a Totodile before in my videos, so to honor the upcoming Fire Crocodile, we have ourselves the Water Gator. We named him Crocopo. We had Crocopo walk beside us as our bodyguard, and ask our mother to please not steal our money. After the professor forcefully inserted his own Pokegear number into our gadget, we took our first big boy steps into the unknown territories of the Johto region. In Cherry Grove City, one of my favorite characters in the Pokemon universe made his return, this running shoes gentleman right here. I want whatever he had for breakfast. We received some old worn out shoes and magically gained the ability to run. Like a nestling having learned how to fly, we would spend the rest of the game running. After a short bit of adventuring, we arrived at Mr. Pokemon's house and received the much touted egg, as well as this swanky new Pokedex given by Professor Oak. Apparently, he has this gift to gauge our abilities from afar, like a scouter, so we could only take his word for it. When we attempted to leave Cherry Grove, we would find ourselves in our first rival battle. Of course, we absolutely flipped this man's Chikorita. And after so long on this channel, I have taken the liberty to name our rival my ass during the police investigation. Video warning here, I guess. I have the maturity level of a preschooler, so expect some ass jokes. Back in New Bark Town, Lyra unnecessarily demonstrated how to catch Pokemon, and this formally marked the beginning of our grand adventure. I spent the rest of the opening hour catching Pokemon. I haven't decided not to complete the National Pokedex at this point, so I was just doing what I usually do in these 100 hours videos. In Violet City's Pokemon Center, we successfully entered the secret code to this primo brother and got a slug my egg. We went up the Sprout Tower and came to an unsightly scene of my ass verbally abusing the elderly. Although we fully condemned this behavior, we would go on to do the exact same thing as our Pidgey, Chippo, absolutely cleaned house. The old monk gave us the TM for Flash, and onwards we go to challenge Faulkner to open the second hour. We had caught a Geodude over at Dark Cave and named him Dudepo, ready for Faulkner. Defeat was not even an option, as Dudepo asserted his dominance over Faulkner's birdies. We got the first badge, and we got to watch this kimono girl spin right round. Professor Elm's assistant caught up with us and pushed the egg responsibility onto us. Came nighttime, we went back to the tower and caught ourselves a ghastly named Hoppo. The rest of the second and third hour was spent getting through Route 32, and the Union Cave where Crocopo evolved into a crocodile. On the outskirts of Azalea, we found ourselves watching a rocket grunt yelling at a passerby. This would ultimately be the start of the Slowpoke Well arc, where we were introduced to Kurt and Proton, a new generation rocket admin. And that was the end of the Slowpoke Well arc, which took 18 minutes. Right as we were about to challenge the second gym, our Slugma egg hatched. We named her... not that, we named her Slugpo. 
After some grinding, Jippo evolved just in time for the Bugsy fight. Despite Jippo's evolution, we ended up using Dudepo for the gym fight. His stopping was just too good to pass up for this gym. Without much trouble, we got the second badge, and we proceeded to face my ass in a Pokemon battle. We weren't really in danger of losing this battle, so I'll keep this one short. Our team pretty much dominated this battle, though his Bayleaf did prove to be a lot more annoying than I thought. We spent the rest of the hour helping out the local woodcutters, more of the kimono girls, and being mistaken for Lyra's boyfriend. The next set of hours were spent grinding, where we painstakingly grinded for Hobo's levels. This was pretty painful. Before moving on with the game, we took on the quiz at the radio tower, where we definitely got it on our first try. Definitely. This prompted Whitney to go back to her gym, where Dude Po steamrolled Whitney's two Pokemon with, uh, well, rollouts. Dude Po, having been grinding on the Sigma Male grind set videos, finally achieved enough confidence to evolve into a Graveler. This wouldn't really be an industrial video without some good old Voltorb flips, so we spent two hours flipping some balls. We had help from the Voltorb flip solver website as usual. This always helps with the early progression of the game, giving us access to a lot of useful TMs quite early on. Nearing the end of the ninth hour, we successfully caught the rogue Sudowoodoo and made it to Ecrotake City. Having spent most of the tenth hour grinding for levels, we went into the Burnt Tower to meet Yuzin and Morty, and of course, our dear rival. My ass challenged us to another Pokemon battle, where he felt pretty confident about beating us. That confidence was completely unfounded, as we completely destroyed my ass. We had the Suicune sniff our feet, and made our way to the gym for another badge giveaway after another lengthy grind. For the Morty fight, it was quite manageable. I really thought we wouldn't lose any Pokemon. I like how the Kadabra just had to ruin our streak. Totally not my fault here. Totally. Despite the minor setback, Whistler got the fourth badge, adding another decoration to our name. We chased off this rocket grunt over at the theater, and was gifted the Surf HM by this nice old man. After popping our head briefly in front of Mount Mortar, we also got another HM from this apologetic hiker. We were finally able to meet Baoba, the new warden of the Safari Zone, over at Route 39. At this point, I was still unsure whether we'll have anything to do with the Safari Zone, but it was still nice to get a strange old man's phone number. Out of the good graces of our heart, we also tried to heal this sick mill tank. It was taking too many orange berries though, so we left it decrepit and battered still. We left the scene with our newfound confidence as a saintly Samaritan. At the 13th hour, we arrived at Olivine City, just in time to see my ass slide out of the gym doors. He was complaining a lot about Jasmine, then left the scene. My ass sure had a lot to say. We scaled the lighthouse to see what was going on, beating trainers and old men along the way. When we got to the top, it was quite disappointing to see that the Ampharos providing light for the seafarers was broken and malfunctioning. Jasmine told us that over at Sandwood, they have the WD-40 needed to fix the machinery, so we really had no choice but to go and swim over the treacherous waters of Route 40. The 15th hour started off with us getting said WD-40. Afterwards, we went for the Chuck Gym battle, where Alakapo redeemed himself from the shameful display over at Morty's Gym. He finished the fight without taking any damage, giving us the chance to snatch the 5th badge away from Chuck. This strange lady outside the gym gave us the Fly HM, and we moseyed on over to the lighthouse again and sprayed the Ampharos' orifices. No, not the one you're thinking about, you pervert. The Ampharos was back up and running, and Jasmine was feeling good enough to serve as Olivine's gym leader once more. I decided to challenge this gym extremely underleveled, but I figured I could do it. Krokopo took out the Steelix, and we basically abused healing items to buy time until Dudepo could use magnitudes to sweep the Magnemites. Six badge obtained, with much difficulties. Nearing the end of hour 15, Krokopo reached his final evolution just north of Mahogany Town. We caught the Red Gyarados and met Lance for the first time at the very aptly named Lake of Rage. He seemed nice at first, but it turned out he was the type of person who would hyperbeam another human being. We spent the rest of the 16th hour meandering about the rocket hideout, meeting my ass, Admin Patrell, Ataki Murkrow, and Admin Ariana. We brought about freedom to the local electrode population and solved the mahogany rocket crisis. This part of the game always felt quite draggy, as always. We would spend the next one and a half hours grinding our underleveled team. Battling Price was nothing difficult, with Shippo the Ampharos taking care of his opening seal, Crocopo his Piloswine, and Shippo again for his Dugong. We received the penultimate Johto badge, only to find that Goldenrod City was under siege by Team Rocket. We took this as a chance for grinding levels, mopping up every rocket grunt we could find. Dudepo and Alakapo proved to be a good matchup for the rockets in the radio tower, eliminating Petrel with fair ease. This kimono girl held us up for a bit, but we could finally get to our long awaited reunion with my ass. I brought along Slugpo to Slugma in anticipation of my ass's Meganium, and she honestly did better than I thought she would. Although the majority of the battle was won with Dudepo and Shippo, Slugpo honestly did quite alright. It was revealed that my ass was smacked by Lance prior to this meeting, and that had left him reflecting upon his philosophies as a Pokemon trainer. 
He left us to our own worries, and we worked our way through the rocket grunts, finally reaching the director. We were given the key card, where it will be used back at the radio tower. We defeated Proton and Ariana on our way up, and finished the Archer fight with only Crocopo. We followed Team Rocket's plans once more, and we were faked out by the director again as well. This old man brings me joy. As it usually goes in the Gen 2 remake run, the next couple of hours were spent getting through Route 44 and the Ice Path, as well as leveling up to Team. The shortage of high-level Pokemon for grinding never ceases to amaze me. The grind was concluded with the evolution of Slugpo. We were finally ready to face Claire as we opened with Shippo against her Gyarados. Shippo made quick work of her Gyarados, while Crocopo took care of the two Dragonairs with Ice Fangs. Crocopo was able to put up a decent fight against the Kingdra, and the fight was concluded with Alakapo putting down the Kingdra for good. Unfortunately, we had to deal with Claire's inability to accept defeat, forcing us to make the trek into the Dragon's Den. We answered this old man's quiz and finally got Claire to hand us the final badge. To conclude the Blackthorn arc, we exited the den and went back in, picking up the free Extreme Speed Dratini. On the 25th hour, we were called back to New Bark Town by Professor Elm, who had a Master Ball ready for our use. We were told that the Kimono Girls were waiting for us at the Ecker Take Dance Theater, so to the theater we went. What awaited us was a series of battles with each Kimono Girls, intended to showcase the evolutions of the series, with the original Gen 2 games being the first to introduce Umbreon and Espeon. We received a clear bell, and was told to scale the bell tower. God, I actually hate this tower. I can never remember the way to go. But we finally made it to the top of Kiyomizudera Temple, and watched some girls from Kyoto dance. Nice. The ho -Oh was Master Balled, and was named as ho -Oh. Perfection. Professor Elm was impressed with our heroics, and recommended challenging the Pokemon League. And we'll do just that. In a bit. I wanted a new team member for the League, so we participated in the bug catching contest, caught a Scyther named Saipo, and came third. Third! Against someone who caught a pincer and Paris. That was mind boggling. Then, we went looking for a metal coat. I had originally planned to get one by hitting Thief on every Magnemite we came across, but I figured we could get one from the Pokeathlon gift shop. At this point, I forgot that the metal coat purchase was only available after we got the National Pokedex. Nevertheless, might as well complete the Pokeathlon objective now. Playing the Pokeathlon minigames with the mouse on the emulator was. unforgiving. It took me about 6 hours to be able to beat the records on the 10 minigames, possibly developing carpal tunnel syndrome on my wrist after flicking the mouse in such unnatural ways for so long. But we were able to beat records after records, and finally completed one of our objectives of the run. By the 34th hour, our trainer card turned blue, signifying the completion of a start objective. During that 6 hours grind, here's the exact moment where I realized the metal coat wouldn't be appearing. So, with the help of a frisky Stantler, we were able to find a metal coat on one of these Magnemites and snatch ourselves a metal coat. We started the journey to the Indigo Plateau, beating trainers and grinding for levels when we could. Saipo was able to evolve into a Scizor, and hopefully he'll be worth all that trouble. It'll be a lot faster with a VS Seeker around. Then, it was time for the pre-elite for a battle with my ass. Honestly, I wanted it to be a fancier battle with higher stakes, but I'm not really sure why I decided to use a ho here. We dominantly scorched my ass, leaving no stones unturned. With such a crushing defeat, we sent my ass deeper into his existential crisis. And then onwards we went, to challenge the Pokemon League. I wish the first four battles were more entertaining, but... None of the Esteem Elite 4 members could stop Swords Dancing Saipo, and he wasn't even a technician Saipo. We made it to Lance with no troubles at all, where Saipo fell to a critical hit the first thing. Lance proved to be a bit more difficult than I thought. However, with all the healing items we bought before going in, we took our time and finished the Pokemon League challenge on the 40th hour, earning us another star on our trainer card. But time waited for no man, we had to keep moving. We flew over to Olivine City and met Professor Oak, who gifted us the National Pokedex. We helped this gentleman's granddaughter and set foot in Vermilion City. Our Kanto gym debut was Lieutenant Surge, who got demolished by Dudepo. Also at the same hour was Sabrina, who couldn't foresee her defeat on our hands. As much as I love playing this Johto remake, I do feel like this Kanto part is always... bland. While going through the Kanto gym battles are quite fun, they're not that hard to beat. Erika, even though she was fairly higher leveled as well, was pretty easy to overcome too, similar to Lieutenant Surge. Janine was a cakewalk, and Brock and Missy didn't really put up much of a fight. The most interesting thing that came out of this whole ordeal was quite possibly the power plant fiasco, where we had a rogue rocket member not knowing they were disbanded, continuing to do evil deeds. We also find out that Misty was trying to score, and the Poke Flute radio channel was also quite neat. But, on the 49th hour, we did get to face my ass again one final time. His team didn't change much, but they did level up a fair bit. Well, a little bit. He was defeated all the same. This prompted my ass to go to the Dragon's Den to train, and this is also quite an entertaining spot, I feel. 
If you go to the Dragon's Den after the Mount Moon encounter, you'll have a chance to witness my ass, I mean, the rival, training. And you'll get to battle with him in a double battle against Lance and Claire. Do be careful though. Lance brought his beefed up team, the one he uses for his second Pokemon League battle. For the next two hours, we spent it covering the rest of the Kanto part of the game, challenging Blaine at the Seafoam Islands, and Blue over at the Viridian Gym. After this, we had successfully beaten all 16 gyms in Pokemon Heart Gold, and a quick trip to Professor Oak revealed that the way to Mount Silver had opened, making it possible for us to challenge Red. But getting to Red's level would take a long, long time. Now, we had to shift our focus to prepare ourselves for the Gen 4 Battle Frontier. I was actually looking forward to this, since I usually do enjoy myself getting through the Battle Frontier. But boy, I was wrong. We'll get to that in a minute. I was trying to set up the Safari Zone for further use, so I spent about an hour trying to figure out how to develop this attraction. Unfortunately, it was time-based, so I had to wait around a couple of times to be able to progress. The reason for developing the Safari Zone is for the Gibble in the Rocky Mountain area, and the Beldum that we could also encounter. I would later find out that here, Beldum only has a catch rate of 3, rivaling some legendaries, so I gave up on the Beldum pretty quick. I also evolved the Spineco into a fortress, since I read that you could trade the fortress with Steven over at Silvco, but I'm not quite sure why I didn't go through with this idea. I might have just forgotten it since I started challenging the Battle Frontier. While getting the Safari Zone ready, I was also trying to grind for levels for my team in preparation for the Red Battle, but oh my lord, this was a painfully slow process. My team was at an awkward point, we were too weak to challenge a new Elite Four and Lance, and were too strong for wild Pokemon. We ended up just repeating battles in front of Mount Silver, and that was extremely slow. And this grinding process already included the rare candies in the game, as well as the ones that you can buy from the Pokeathlon Dome. We started challenging the Battle Tower at the start of the 60 second hour, where it honestly started off pretty well. We were able to reach Frontier Brain Palmer on the first run, reaching our 20th streak. Then, we lost soon after. And this continued, for a long, long time. I feel like a lot of people can relate to the fact that the Battle Tower just gets incredibly broken after a set amount of time. It keeps redesigning itself to counter your team, and you would just get to a point where the opponent's team keeps playing perfectly. This must have been what Krillin was feeling when he went up against Frieza. Or just the entire Dragon Ball series, really. I checked what I did during my Platinum run, and came to the conclusion that the leading Metagross with Trick that I used really made the difference. But during all these attempts, I've already spent a long time in the Safari Zone trying to catch myself a Gibble. I did catch one in the end, calling it Arpo. Grinding into level 50 didn't take too long, but I did have to EV train my team if I wanted to overcome the battle tower. And since this was Johto, I wanted to adopt the Karen philosophy. The Johto Elite for Karen, that is. This infamous line. In the end, just like how Krillin scored Android 18, we also saw a light at the end of our tunnel. We switched teams after every two sets, and this seemingly worked. Coming off a win over a team with legendaries, Tamapo actually had the best RNG in this final battle. His first air slash understandably one shot at the Blaziken. He then flinched the subsequent Feraligator and scored a crit. The Venusaur at the end was easy work. We successfully achieved the 100 win streak at the Battle Tower and got ourselves the Violet Trainer card. Finally. I definitely took too long to beat the Battle Frontier objective. I wanted to do a lot more for the video. To complete the Grey card objective, we hurriedly chose Crocopo as our subject and hunted for the Shiny Leaves. Each nature has 5 routes to look from and this didn't take too long. We showed our Crocopo with the 5 Shiny Leaves and Lyra kindly made a crown for him. Also, a certificate of some sort. We completed all the objectives for this video, finally obtaining the Great Trainer card. But we weren't quite done. Originally, I wanted to play and showcase the special event Pokemon episodes like the Pichu, Celebi, and the Arceus ones, but I figured I should stick with what the vanilla game had to offer first. We went to the ruins of Alf and completed the unknown side quest, which was a major pain to do. But of course, as all things are with content creation, my OBS was set to a different window at this time, recording a completely black screen. The footage you're seeing now is me revisiting the ruins after its completion, so unfortunately you won't get to see me struggle with the whole puzzle piece for 20 minutes. What a shame. Here's a sample of that black screen recording. We then grinded again at the Pokemon League. Even the League wasn't really useful for leveling up, as most of the time I ended up not using the full team for the whole thing. So, at the 100th hour, I gave up grinding and went up Mount Silver with the team in the early 70s. And here we are, at Mount Silver's summit, ready to face Red. Kind of. Red led with his signature Pikachu, and we sent out Arpo first. Arpo used a Source Dance, and the Pikachu hit a beefy Iron Tail. Thankfully, Arpo's Earthquake was more than enough. Red sent out his Lapras next, and Arpo fired his final Earthquake, almost able to kill the Lapras. We sent out Tamapo next, who couldn't perform as well as I thought because of the heal. 
time up with it enough for Saipo, who finished the Lapras with Iron Head. Dude Po came out next for Red's Charizard, but missed the Stone Edge after the Charizard's Dragon Pulse. I opted to heal, but quickly understood that I needed a sacrifice to have a fresh turn. So, out came Jipo, who served as well as a Meat Shield. Dude Po made his comeback and hit a Stone Edge this time. With the Charizard down, we switched to Saipo for Red's Venusaur and stacked two Source Dances while utilizing a full restore. The two Source Dances were enough to one-shot the Venusaur with a Wing Attack, the Blastoise with an X Scissor, and the Snorlax as well. Red left without saying a word, and we witnessed the credits for the second and final time. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please excuse the short afterthought of mine. As much as I complain about the grind being so painfully slow in this game, I've always enjoyed playing through Johto. There is always a great deal of charm in the 2D era of the Pokemon games, which I think lasted all the way to the 5th generation. 100 hours in Pokemon game time is short, or at least, it should be short. The joy of playing a Pokemon game shouldn't possibly dissipate in under 100 hours, yet I never did spend more than 70-80 to 80 hours in Sword and Shield, even with the DLCs. And I never went past Bailstone City in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. I really couldn't. Setting my thoughts on Pokemon Scarlet and Violet aside, I really hope this upcoming generation of Pokemon games can bring about that wonder and excitement that Pokemon used to incite. The kind that made 100 hours feel like one again.